session only has three talks in it, so it's shorter, which is hopefully not the reason why you all come to this one. <laughs> but we've, we've got the best for last, and if you remain for all the three talks, there will be an additional bonus event at the end of it that will be the talk of the conference afterwards, so if you leave before, you'll miss out on it. Um, as scientists, we generally tend to focus on the facts and accuracy of these facts, and less so on the narrative that strings together a whole lot of facts to tell a larger integrated story. We, through work that I've done, we notice that the facts can actually polarise the community. And in the world of Trump, we have alternative facts. And in other instances, you can have the same facts, but you have a different narrative that tells a different story or a different truth to those facts. So we have Michael, who's from Heaps Good. And Michael is going to tell us a story. So, by the way, it's just that slide. That's it. <laughs> There's no other slides. Um, and I have a <laughs> draft number 326 of my talk. <laughs> I uploaded last night and I'll tweet it out this afternoon. So if you follow at heaps good, you'll be able to see it. Alternatively, you can wait until next week when all of the things that I've added in um, in the last few hours um, will be included. Um, so, Nainari Michael, Mani Naputni Kanayata Ana, which translates to My name is Michael, it is good that you are here on Ghana land. I arrived on this land in a place known as Yerta Bulti, land of the sleeping on a ship from England many, many years ago. All of my ancestors come from across the seas, from Wales, England, Scotland, and Ireland. Now I dwell, though, in this place, the land of the Ghana people, and it is with great respect that I acknowledge the ancestors and the current custodians of the land upon which we all walk. This is part of my story, or at least some of it, as I say. Now, for another story. Once upon a time, there were a number of Oh. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so it's all about you now, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> Start again. <laughs> For your benefit, whoever you are, <laughs> once upon a time there were a number of bears. How many? Three. It's not a trick question, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> One morning, those three bears went for a stroll, and while they were away, a young girl broke into their house. What was her name? She ate their breakfast. What were they going to have for breakfast? Porridge. Whose porridge did she eat, and why? Baby bears, because it was just fried. Yes. Now, she broke a piece of furniture. What was it? Yeah. Yes. She went upstairs and tried to sleep off the shame of her wanton theft and destruction. <laughs> Why wasn't she able to get to sleep in Mama Bear's bed? Too it was too soft. What was her middle name? Yeah, we don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> So, when was the last time you heard that story? Or if you've got children, when was the last time, or grandchildren, when was the last time you told that story? Possibly 25 years ago. And yet, we remember it. We remember the data that is the number of bears, the name of the girl, the type of the food, the temperatures of the food, the comfort of the chairs and the beds, and so it goes. We remember the data. Why do we remember the data? Because it is all wrapped up into a story. We'll try that again. It is all wrapped up into a story. <laughs> I know, you thought this was going to be quiet and we were just going to relax. No. Um, stories are the most human of things. More than most things we do, they are what define us. We interpret our woke universe through them and drift into stories through the dreams that we enter. Stories are what make culture, and we become part of a culture when the stories of that culture become a part of who we are. 
for we are the storytelling animal. It is through stories that we engage with each other, it is through stories that we understand and engage with the world around us, and this has critical implications for science communication and for science programs. That's one of my scribbles, what on earth have I said? Oh yes, and as it was said this morning in one of the talks, it is the story that invites you in. And this is key. A storyteller needs to ask, who is the listener? Because if you're wanting to tell a story, it is your job to find out who the listener is. And equally as important, how do we know that they're listening? Now that's not just a question that I as a storyteller and a story writer need to ask. It's a question that anyone that is involved in citizen science or science communication needs to ask. Advertisers have known the importance of stories for generations as they make millions of dollars from products that kill people through cancer, obesity, brain damage. Just think about it. Cigarettes, soft drinks, alcohol. They are products that kill people. I've bought into the story of one of them, just one of them, and you will see that when we have the drink session afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but for the other two, no, not a part of me or my story. So if we're able to get people to part with their money to buy products that kill them, surely there are stories that could be told that allow us to better engage the non-engaged in scientific activity. Conspiracy theories of story, Loch Ness, Yetis, Area 51, anti-vaxxers, all have a narrative that for them makes sense. Trump, Trump is a story. Trump created a narrative and was elected because enough people bought into that narrative. Now, don't forget, I didn't say that all stories were happily ever after. <laughs> As Jonathan Goschel has said, in the storytelling animal. While Homo sapiens sees us described as the wise ape, we might equally refer to ourselves as Homo fictus, the storytelling ape. Indeed, given the current state of the planet, wise ape might not be all that appropriate. Now, it is my contention that all effective science communication is good storytelling, and that bad science communication is because of bad storytelling. People do not engage with data. They do not engage with the bowl of porridge. It is a story within the, which the bowl of porridge sits. They engage with stories and in the facts that dwell amongst those stories. But, of course, we are scientists at heart as well. So what does the science tell us? Well, in the storytelling animal, Gostrel notes, the constant firing of our neurons in response to fictional stimuli strengthens and refines the neural pathways that lead to skillful navigation of life's problems. We saw some neurons in Amy's talk a little while ago. And I was really interested because she talks about gaming and the gamification. Games are stories. And the capacity for people, and she talked a little bit about narrative. I'd argue that narrative is essential to gaming. Um, without narrative, there is no gaming. Um, Smith in the Science of Story notes, experiencing a story alters our neurochemical processes so that stories are a powerful force in shaping human behaviour. And Leah Weldrick in assessing the research states, when we are being told a story, things change dramatically. Not only are the language processing parts in our brain activated, but any other area in our brain that we would use when experiencing the events of that story are activated as well. There's even research that tells us that stories can, told well can synchronise the listener's brain with the teller's brain. And that's that stuff I was talking about before. Who's listening and how do you know that they're listening? Now, one of the first citizen science projects I ever became aware of was um, Operation Magpie. UniSA, um, amongst others, partnered with radio station 891. In Operation Magpie, there's some great data that was collected, as well as some wonderful stories of people's personal interactions. If you ever get to see and read, buy, download the fearsome flute players, uh, Professor Chris Daniels is the co-writer, along with Phil Roteman. Um, and yet the data is, by definition, incomplete. The data was incomplete, and I remember we, Chris and I were talking about this at the time, because the demographic was incomplete. So we know lots about the magpies in the Adelaide Hills, but what about the people in Elizabeth? What about the strangers that were spoken about this morning? What about the people in Norlunga? They've got magpies too, but why are they not engaged? Because there's not a story that resonates with them, because the stories of the ABC don't resonate with them. On spiders, spider stories and spidery nightmares, Phil <coughs> kind of eventually basically said, 
The adults went, spiders, ooh, yuck, and were disengaged. The kids went, spiders, ooh, yuck, and they were fabulously engaged. <laughs> different story from a different demographic. The extraordinary success of Cat Tracker is due to people wanting to find out, oh, where's Tiddles? Tell us about the adventures of Tiddles the cat. <laughs> of course, there are dabblers and those who go the whole hog. What are those who don't even dabble? The strangers that we spoke of this morning. How do you turn non-participants into tab dabblers or even people that go the whole hog? Supported by Inspiring South Australia, I'm currently involved in a project as a facilitator um, with the Narracourt Caves and the Narracourt community and the Narracourt Council. The initial idea came from the council and from Liz Reid, a paleontologist at Adelaide University, who wanted to find a way to help re-engage the community with the caves. 20 years of World Heritage listing is like it kind of became off limits, so you can't go and have the parties we used to have and stuff. So my job was to, is not to write a performance, but it's to facilitate the writing of the performance. Because in the end, this is their story. My story is here on Ghana land. One of my favourite moments in the process so far has been watching the Year 9 and 11 drama students go from this thing when I first met them. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, we went there as kids. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, we were five. Lovely, nice, super, but whatever. <laughs> in the space of half an hour, going from that, as I had a thigh like a Leo skull with me, to all of a sudden going, hang on a minute. This is our story, isn't it? This is a part of who we are. And I remember standing on the balcony looking across the horizon, towards the horizon, and I asked them to imagine <laughs> a herd of diprotodon grazing right there because that's where they grazed. Fly like a Leo. Drop bears for those uh, non-Australian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, really, they are. Um, <laughs> I asked them to imagine that Thylacaleo lurking upon the bough of the tree ready to pounce because that's where it would have done so. And to think about the footsteps beneath the ground upon which we all walk, to understand that amongst those footsteps lies the story of who we are, lies the story of who they are. Now I spoke to the students after they put together a, a, a preview of this performance late last year and I said look we're going to do this thing in April but it's not part of school work and uh, you're going to have to rehearse during school holidays. Are you in? Without exception all of them put their hands up and the most fascinating response from them was we want to keep telling this story. Five minutes. Fuck. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, God, I'm rewriting it again. Um, <laughs> one of the other interesting things, as an aside, um, is that they're now ongoing discussions with the high school and the caves about how they can utilise the science in the caves to um, tell other aspects of the curriculum. Uh, because, of course, paleontology, just so you know, is all of the sciences. It's physics, it's chemistry, it's maths, it's geology, it's sport, it's drama, it's all of those things. So, um, but here's the thing. When researching Galaxy Zoo, um, Eden said, citizen science is a powerful tool for connecting people to science, but in the US such initiatives have not connected as well to groups that have been historically underrepresented in science. Research suggests that while several factors contribute to this lack of diverse participation in citizen science, the critical hurdle may be an absence of alignment between community priorities and research objectives. A process such as that, project such as that in Narracourt, I suspect can change those community priorities and move it toward greater participation in science as well as great, greater scientific literacy. Sharon this morning in speaking about um, the research about ecological literacy spoke about you know, familiar long-term relationships with place are key to ecological responsibility. Now here in Australia, relationship to place is something that has been done remarkably well in this country for most of its 70,000 or more year history. We get it. Some of us. <laughs> Probably not Andrew Bolt. <laughs> Is this on? Yes, Bolty. <laughs> um, but uh, where am I? Yes. A study by King and Lynch of a project involved in the nesting of birds noted that 63% of the participants said they wanted to do something for nature in terms of being involved. Great, but why? 2013 study of Galaxy Zoo people said, oh yes. 
primary motivation for being involved in this project is to contribute to scientific research. Yes, but why? The authors of that paper then stated, the fact that nearly 40% of respondents report contributing to science as their primary motivation is stunning. Actually, no, it isn't stunning. And it isn't a surprise that people would want, as the ABC described in the Galaxy Explorer Citizen Science Project, when it comes to astronomy projects, to classify a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's such a course we would. Astronomical citizen science projects are all about exploring the mysteries of the universe with you helping to find your place within it. They are about aliens, black holes, they are about Luke Skywalker, Wookiees, Darth Vader and Captain James T. Kirk. It is not a surprise that you would great, get great numbers, up to 80% of Mars involved. One minute, two minutes. Two. Yeah, I can do this. I can do this. How can it be citizen science if the citizens participating do not represent the citizens of a community? And it's probably not the best science it could be either if you don't have access to the greatest number of people, the di most diverse population. And people not just within our own traditional Western science culture. We need different ways of understanding to explore these issues as we saw from your fantastic talk this morning. And thank you for, for what you said and the Eureka Prize was so thoroughly deserved. Um, so what if you're able to find a magical way of increasing the numbers and literacy and broadening the demographics of those who are engaged? Well, it's not magic, but it does involve understanding why we need dragons. Are you trying to make a point? <laughs> <laughs>